guys are really, you need to keep it down just a little bit. That's, come on, some people are going to think we're just really crazy in this church. Happy New Year. Hey, it's great to see you this morning, and I am going to remember to dismiss any kids who are still left with us. They were part of our, they joined us for communion this morning. You can make your way to Children's Church. We love our young people. Let's give our young people a hand as they walk out. Yes, and with that happy new that first happy new year response, I want to highlight a special class that we have on uh, vitamins and energy in the new year. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to invite you to take them and turn to 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, as you are turning, let me just highlight one really exciting and big announcement, and that has to do with connect groups. So in uh, just a number of weeks, in February, we are going to launch... And our goal is to launch uh, 10 connect groups. And we're excited because in a church, uh, one of the things that people always desire is relational connections that go deeper than a Sunday morning where somebody says, how are you doing? And somebody else says, good, how are you doing? And everybody, both people say, fine, and they, move, they go on. And, and we believe that these connect or small groups are going to be one important way that we can build relational connections. But then there's a second thing, and that is this. And time and time again, it has been shown that one of the the best ways to grow in the faith, to grow in Christ, is to do it in a small group dynamic, a small group setting. And so we believe that there is going to be great growth among those who would say, you know what, I do want to plug in and go to a connect group. So you'll hear more about that every week. We're excited. I would ask you now just to do this, be uh, thinking about or praying about for sure our endeavors and thinking about your ability to participate in a small group and there's more information surely to come. So we come this morning to 1 Corinthians and when we come to Corinthians we find Paul talking about the gospel in very vivid terms. He talks about the good news of Jesus in language that he is very similar to language he used with the Romans. So if you're, his letter to the Romans. So if you're reading through uh, the, the New Testament and you come to Corinthians, you'll see some things again and it keeps going. And you'll find that some of the language isn't just the Apostle Paul trying to use some, some good adjectives and things about the good news. You'll you'll realize that he keeps saying the same things over and over again, and they're critical to understanding what the good news means in the life of a believer. So there's Corinth. This is a city that's one of the most wicked cities in the Roman Empire. It had a reputation for its wickedness. And... Here Paul writes them a letter. The church in Corinth, in this wicked city, is a young church. So imagine those new to the faith dealing with all that's happening and what is the result of this young church in this wicked city is that you get a church that looks way too much like the world. Paul sees it and he knows it and so he writes to them. He spent time with them and he He writes to them this letter and he wants them to know, among many other things, that there's something about the gospel of Jesus Christ that is more than just a a simple prayer. It's more than just, you know, uh, uh, one time you do this and then that is. He wants them to understand something that is transformative about the gospel that they carry around as believers and it's something that impacts their life every single day. And it is more than enough in terms of power and grace and wisdom 
to help them defeat division in their life and in their church, to help them defeat the sin and wickedness that's all around, to help them stand and live strong in the midst of all that's going on in the city. He wants them to understand that this gospel is something that is part of the wisdom and the power of the Almighty God. And he writes in his second letter to them that he says he says it this way, we have this treasure in jars of clay, this treasure in earthen vessels. So he sees us as this frail, fragile, breakable vessel. But inside of it, God places something that is, that is eternal and infinite in power. It is the good news. And he says we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And that is how it is always. Frail, fragile, breakable humanity graced when they receive Christ with a treasure of infinite value and we carry it around every day. So here we are in this reality and what does it mean? What does it really mean to carry the good news of Jesus and understanding that is vital to their walk in Corinth, and because it's vital to them, and because the Holy Spirit put it there, I want to say it's vital to you and to me today. What does it mean? So we're going to look at that, and I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 1, 27. I'll start there, and I want you to notice as we're reading concepts of wisdom and power. Verse 27, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. There it is, wisdom, right out of the bat. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. You see power or strength. Verse 28, he chose the lowly things of the world to and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you're in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now in chapter 2 and verse 1. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, As I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. There it is, power. But with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom but on God's power. Let's pray. Father, let the, let the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word move among us, fill us, refresh us, transform us to your glory. I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase That you'd be honored today by the way we respond to your word. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. So in San Francisco, in the 1850s during the California gold rush, there was a man who was a canvas salesman. You might know the story. You'll figure it out as I share it. And he noticed that the prospectors and the miners had clothes that weren't really enduring their, uh, their work. And so he stitched together some of his canvas and uh, it lacked in comfort for sure, but it surely made up for that in durability. And then this man realized that if he took the canvas that was dyed blue, the denim, that it it was more popular and it became a mainstay 
for the prospectors and the miners and later on ranchers and cowboys. And the man's name was Levi Strauss. And the blue jean industry is now, it's, you, to say it's everywhere would be an understatement. Blue jeans are everywhere. And what is this, you know, what is the same? So they're, they're, the cuts have changed. The styles have changed. Some of the styles we love. Some of the styles we wish would go away. Some of you want some to come back. But the cuts have changed, the styles have changed, there's even different colors, all different kinds of colors of blue jeans, and you know how it is, but, but what remains, what makes a jean a jean? It's the fabric, the denim. I know there are different types of denim, but that, that certain weave of cotton and however it's made, I don't know, but that fabric makes jeans jeans so you can look at one cut in style and say call those jeans and another one jeans and there's that that enduring part and when Paul is writing to the Corinthians and a church that is really a, a, a little bit or a lot a bit of a mess he's writing to them about the fabric of their faith he wants them to understand in all this mess what really, really is enduring and matters and is at the core. And he's talking to them about the gospel. The gospel, the very core. And so it is in the church. Sometimes we get pulled by cuts and styles of religion and cuts and styles of, of belief. And, and it's a little bit here and a little bit there. And we, we get so much talking about those things that we miss what is really at the core and at the fabric of our belief. This morning what I want to say to you is that at the very core of it is this thing we call the good news. It's not just the core, it's everything. Jesus Christ, him crucified, raised, lives, he's alive, and he, he lives in us, and you and me, that's the core, that's all, that's everything, and there's something powerful about it, and lest we ever think that it's just a prayer we pray one time and go on, we miss what God wants for us every single day. It's the power of Jesus. And lest we forget, we carry that news to a world that is lost and dying and needs every bit of us understanding every bit of this and living it and shining it to the full. So how, do we under, how are we to understand the good news? How are we to carry it? How do we avoid taking it for granted and missing something of this fabric of all that we hold dear? I'm going to look at three things this morning, and the first thing is this. We need to remember that God shops at secondhand stores. It's kind of a fancy or maybe not so creative way to say that God is pleased. Now think about this, and let's think about it together. God is pleased to redeem to buy worn out, secondhand, discarded, seemingly invaluable souls and buy them and bring them to himself. If I was to give this another, another title, I would say that we understand the gospel first from a stance or a position of humility. Great humility. How do we carry the gospel? With great humility. Every day. Humble. Before the Lord. And even before our brothers and sisters. To qualify for heaven. And this will be on the screen and in your notes. To qualify for heaven. You have to first recognize that you don't qualify. You and I don't make it. Humility always comes before exaltation. 
Humility always precedes, it's the seedbed, if you will. It is the place, the soil into which God sows his grace of forgiveness. It is this brokenness. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. Remember the Beatitudes. This is this essence of humility and brokenness. It is the seedbed, and when God sees that, he throws in grace, and we're made alive. The servant who walks in God's power is the servant who walks in humility. My great-grandma, my great-grandmother, so my dad's mother's mother, had a Dutch oven. If you don't know what a Dutch oven is, it's like an oversized pot with a lid that you can actually put in the oven. She had a club aluminum, hammer craft, Dutch oven. Somehow, I inherited that amazing Dutch oven. So some years ago, I found it in my garage. I was like, what is this thing? And it was in my garage, and I was going to throw it out. Before I threw it out, I thought I would go down. We had a place called the Village This and That, and I went to the Village This and That. I thought, I wonder what the club aluminum, hammer craft, maybe this is an antique, maybe it'll bring something. And Mike there at the Village This and That, secondhand story, he said, you know what, no, that's, that's pretty much worth nothing. And I was like, okay, thanks, Mike. And I'm not sure what happened to it. I, I, maybe we sold it in a garage sale. But um, I want you to imagine with me for just the, a moment this, this scene. So that's all true. Now this is made up, okay? Imagine this scene. I go down to Mike. I say, Mike, here's the club lumen. What do you think you can get for it? He said, I don't know. Maybe I'll get $5 for it. I said, okay, sell it. If you, if you get it, you know, on consignment or whatever. He says, I sold it. He calls me one day. I sold your club aluminum, your great-grandmother's. I, and I, I got the $5, and he said, I'm, I'm going to keep, you know, two fifty, and here's your two fifty. And I walk away, and I say, great. That's amazing. Thank you, Mike. Who bought it? He said, a guy named Fred Flintstone. He bought it. So... I go over to Fred. I, mean, I just can't. I, I go to Fred. I say, Fred, you bought my... The, the, that's my great-grandmother's. What are you going to do with it? He said, oh, I don't know, that piece of junk, I'm going to melt it down. I said, Fred, you can't melt it down. That was my great-grandmother's. He says, you want it back? No, I don't want it back. I just, you just can't melt it down. I mean, you just can't do that to it. I said, what do you want then? He said, more money? I said, sure. How much? 50 bucks. Thinking he'll never, sure, here's your 50 Oh, I meant 100 bucks, you know. No, no, 50 is enough. Get out of here. So imagine that scene. I read the paper a week later. Fred has melted down the aluminum. He's created a, a, a piece of art that is so grand and so amazing that a museum offers him a million dollars. They write it up in the paper. I run, I run to the museum. I say, I say, that, that was, that's my great-grandmother's, that's my aluminum, I get some of that money. And, they, they, and they, they just say, get out of here. I run to the paper, I tell them, they call the police and they, they commit me somewhere. When we come to 1 Corinthians, now I want you to look at verse 27, chapter 1. Paul writes, but, but God chose the foolish things of the world. Foolish. God chose the weak things in the next phrase there. God chose the weak things of the world. Weak. Verse 28, he chose the lowly things and the despised things and the things that are not. What is he talking about? He's talking about you. He's talking about me. Lowly, despised, weak, foolish, nothing. Unless we ever forget that it was God who chose these despised things. And he chose them, it says, to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast. If we ever forget that God chose us when we were nothing, 
And he fashioned us and formed us and made us brand new from nothing to brand new, lest we ever forget that. And get proud and high and mighty and uppity about anything that we do while a Christian. Any of our ministry, look what I've done. Look how I do this and say that and how I've impacted over here and done this over there and how I've made a difference and look what I've done. That's like me shouting, that aluminum was mine, it's my great-grandmother's, I get some credit for that. It's crazy. Because God is a God who shops at second-hand stores and he takes us when we're nothing and molds us and fashions us and makes us brilliant and new. And he didn't pay $5 or $50, but he paid an infinite price, nothing less than the life of his son. That's where he started. When we were of no value, he still paid an infinite price and then through that made us into something grand, new creations, new creatures in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come, everything's new. How do we carry the gospel? We carry it remembering every day that without that, we're just an earthen vessel that is really inconsequential or very breakable, but all of a sudden inside is the wisdom and power of God. Why does God work this way? Verse 29, so that no one may boast before him. Verse 31, therefore as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So how do we walk through this life as a Christian? How do we walk through this life as a person, if your family is thriving, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. If people look at you and say, your family's amazing, what are you doing? How do you make it work? And it's happening, what do you say? Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. How do you carry the gospel? You say, listen, if there's anything good, it's God. If there's any blessing, it's God. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. If your business is successful and you're a believer and you're carrying the gospel and people come to you and they say, look at how good that is. How do you do it? What is your secret? What do you do somewhere in your response? How do you carry the gospel? You remember where you were and what God did for you and you let him who boasts, boast in the Lord and you say, it is God, it is the Lord and somewhere testify to the goodness of God. Whatever it is, if it's happening in your life, Remember, and always remember, how do we carry the gospel from a position of humility? God shopped at a second-hand store, and everything we have, we now owe to him. That is how we carry the good news. Number two, how do we carry the good news? Remember this, you can win at Bible Jeopardy and lose to the devil. If I had to give this another title, I would say that we understand the gospel and how we live as, as vessels, earthen vessels carrying the gospel. We remember it through faith. Faith. It not only impacts how we accept Jesus, but how we share Jesus. And I have this in the notes and on the screen. Knowledge and understanding are important to faith in Christ but knowledge and understanding cannot replace faith in Christ. Knowledge can inform you, it can help you, but it is not the answer. It can't save you. We share Jesus and we want people to know about Jesus, but the knowledge won't save them, it is the faith it is faith that saves them, saving faith. I want you to think for a moment about this letter that Paul wrote. And the backdrop to this letter is this Roman world. And, and in, in their world, there was much ado about philosophy and there was much ado about different ideas and different thoughts and people were always talking and thinking. And, and before Paul visited the Corinthians, if we think of Paul's journeys, we can divide them into several 
different trips. Scholars divide them into three journeys. We call them Paul's missionary journeys. And on his second missionary journey, he was in what we call today Syria. And he made his way north up over the Mediterranean and and made his way over eventually to Athens uh, in, in Greece. And there he presented, and we find this in Acts chapter 17, he shared at a meeting, and the meeting was a group of intellectuals known as the Areopagus. And when he went there and he shared with them, Acts 17, 21 says this, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. The ideologies and the philosophies of government and religion milling it over, over and over and over again. It's rhetoric, it's another idea, it's another thought, and it kept happening over and over. And so Paul comes to them and he begins to speak to them and he speaks to them in a way to try to convince them of an understanding about an, an, an altar he sees there to an unknown God. They have all these other gods that that have attribution, but there's this one to an unknown God. It's as if they they wanted to cover themselves, so they had one to maybe there's a God they don't know about. And so Paul begins to use that, and he begins to try to, to talk to them and reason with them about the God that you and I know, and he's using this this altar to an unknown God. And in and then when he's done with that, there's very little produce, very little happens as a result of his ministry there. And then after he's in Athens, he goes to Corinth. And he, he's in Athens a very short time. He goes to Corinth. He's there for about a year and a half, this second journey. So very little happens. He does his best. He goes to Corinth. And then later on, he writes this letter back to the people in Corinth. And look at Verse 1 of chapter 2. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. Verse 2. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you, look at verse 3, in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom but on God's power. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but I know I've been there, and I was actually there recently where I'm trying to talk to somebody, and I'm sitting down, and I feel like all I'm doing is trying to somehow explain them to a place where they say yes to Jesus. I'm trying to, you know, give them some kind of a reasoning that's somehow going to go and make their life change. Words in a a small way might begin to persuade somebody, but it is the power of God that transforms a life. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't study the Word of God, but I'm saying that we need something other than ideas, and we need something other than words, and we need something other than philosophies and arguments. Go back to 1 Corinthians 1.22. He says, Jews demand miraculous signs. That's power. And Greeks look for wisdom. But he says, we preach Christ crucified. That's the good news. And here's what he says about Christ crucified. Now notice this. He says it's a stumbling block to the Jews. Why is it a stumbling block to the Jews? Because in their mind, their understanding was Messiah would not be crucified. They wanted a Messiah who would come in power, so this this causes them to stumble. I can't believe in a Messiah who would go to a cross, and they reject it. They reject it on the basis of it doesn't match up with what they, they think. He says it's a stumbling block to the Jews. He says it's foolishness to the Greeks. It's a philosophy that they can't even begin to understand. You mean your teacher, your leader? This man 
this rabbi or whatever is killed and, and, and they reject it. They wanted a new idea. It's foolishness to them. But verse 24, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. You want the power of God? Where does it rest in the simple message, the truth of Jesus, the good news? You want the wisdom of God? It's not the wisdom of the world. It may make no sense. Preaching is even called foolishness in this passage. But it's the wisdom of God. You want the wisdom of God and you want the power of God. The, the, the word is this, that we carry it every day in earthen vessels. It is called the good news of Jesus Christ. The world needs nothing more. We can add nothing to it. It is the transformative reality. Jesus saves. Jesus sets free. Your sins are forgiven. You're made new. There's new life. There's eternity. What is it? The good news of Christ. Paul saw this church getting caught up in believing that somehow or another it was about a new doctrine or a new teaching following Paul, following Apollos, following Peter or Cephas or following someone else and he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're missing it, it's not that, it's Christ and him crucified. The power and wisdom of God. How do we carry this? Listen, we might have all the knowledge in the world, but until we recognize what we really have in faith in Jesus that we carry every day, we can still be losing to the enemy, and Jesus didn't die for us to lose. He already won. He came to give us full life. Let's live in the truth of the of the faith that we have. We can't, prove so, we can't prove our way in. We can believe our way in. The power and the wisdom of God. Number three. Number three, how do we handle this thing we call the gospel? Number three says, giving new meaning to the sentence, handle with care. If I had to give this a different title, it would be about... The fact that the gospel is meant to be proclaimed. You and I are meant to shine it. We're meant to share it. We're meant to give it out, to, to proclaim it, to spread it. This is not a thing that you find on some Himalayan mountain where you have some inner experience that is your inner experience you keep to yourself and it's beautiful and serene and peaceful and and there it is and what's good for you is good for you and good for the other person is good for the other person you know to each his own I'm here to tell you this morning and I realize that there are people who have a you know some kind of a they they they, they they're offended by the fact that there are those who would who would declare it but the gospel is the good news, we share it, it is news for the whole world. It is meant to be proclaimed, it is meant to be shared. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. Paul even writes this, for Christ did not send me to baptize. He explains just before this who he baptized at Corinth, but he wants him to, I mean he's even like, Listen, I get it, baptism's important and, you know, that's all part of it, but Christ didn't even send me to do that. What did he send him to do? But to preach the gospel. He says, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Doesn't need to be dressed up, doesn't need to be fancied up. We don't need to worry about it. All we need to do is proclaim it in the name of Jesus. Verse 21 I don't have this on the notes, but verse 21, Paul says, For since the, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. Let me just stop there. What he's saying is, God's wisdom was that you could not have some earthly wisdom to get there. God said, I'm not going to let you get there by earthly wisdom. It says, God was pleased that through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. 
If you leave here on a Sunday morning and you say, you know, that skinny guy up there, he's really saying some foolish things. Praise the Lord. It's in the Bible. Verse 23. But we preach. So there's the foolishness of what was preached. Verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. When we understand that we're carrying the wisdom and the power every moment of every day, something happens. It is the answer for the world, and you'll find that you can't contain it. You can't withhold it. You say, Eric, you don't understand. I'm not good at sharing. I can't talk to people. It doesn't work for me. I want you to look back again at 1 Corinthians 2. In verse 1, if anybody had the qualifications to share the gospel, it was Paul, Pharisee of Pharisees, knows the Old Testament backward and forward. He has had an encounter with Jesus. He's an apostle. God's used him to do miraculous and amazing things even He'll raise someone from the dead. I mean, this is a a man who is in every way equipped and prepared to be this person who knows what he's doing to share the gospel. 1 Corinthians 2, 1, and so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you. I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom. He comes saying, I really don't have the words I don't have the words, I don't have the way, this is Paul. So if you feel that you don't have the words or the way, you're in good company. You're with Paul. So what does he do? He just proclaims Jesus Christ crucified. He claims freedom in Jesus. He spreads the word. Nothing special, nothing fancy, doesn't need to be helped in any way. We just need to shine it. Salt and light to the world caught in sin. How do we carry the gospel as believers? We can't help but let it shine the good news all around to the glory of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask Brandon to come and play something quietly. And as he comes, I'm going to share a final story, and then we're going to, going to pray. Another foolish story. In 2015, in the fall of 2015, In New Jersey. Does anything good happen in New Jersey? If you're from New Jersey, we have a special support group for you right after church. No, I'm just kidding. We love you dearly. You'll never come back again now. In New Jersey, 2015, in the fall, in a basement was found a painting. Among other things, there was going to be a local auction for a home. You might have remembered this. You might remember it. And what happened? Some some dealers who knew their stuff were at the auction. They recognized that painting enough. They had hoped the painting would go for $800. The dealers paid $870,000 for the painting. They later turned around and sold it. And those dealers sold it, they don't, we don't know exactly, somewhere between three and four million dollars. It was a nine inch painting and it was a Rembrandt. In a, in a basement. In 2019, we start a new year, and I share that story with you for this reason, 
thinking of Springfield Assembly, thinking of all of you. God wants to refresh us and renew us and revive us and stir us to the core of our being, I believe, in our hearts about 2019 and what it means to carry around the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is for you to the transforming of your soul, to the changing of your family and the friends and, and, and our community. He wants us to be fresh and new. Not so this thing is kind of hidden in there and we don't even realize how valuable it is, this thing we carry around. But all of a sudden, to realize again, fresh and new, wow, look what you've done, Lord. In fragile, breakable me, in you, he's entrusted. It's a deposit. It's something precious and invaluable. And in, in it is encompassed the fullness of the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's the gospel. It's what we're all about. In a moment, we're going to pray together, and, and the prayer is going to be a corporate prayer that we are renewed and revived in that understanding from His Word, by His Spirit. And this year, before we do that, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes if you wouldn't. If you're in this room and you do not know that you know 